From George Washington to the brand new cadets and midshipmen flooding from this nation's service academies, all have studied the revolutionary tactics of one of the greatest military commanders of all time, Hannibal Barca of Carthage. Hannibal was a general who led his armies through the Iberian Peninsula, across the Alps, and into the mainland of Italy, ravaging the countryside and toying with Rome. So how could such a man reach such staggering heights on the battlefield? Who was Hannibal Barca, and why is he lofted in the annals of military history as one of the greatest generals of all time? To answer this question, we must first understand the house that Hannibal was born into. Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barca, was the commander of the Carthaginian forces in the First Punic War, a war that he had lost. Hannibal grew up having sworn an oath to, quote, never be a friend to Rome, a mentality that would greatly influence him in the years to come. Hannibal was moved to Spain in his early life and at 26 was given command of his first army, which he used to conquer the Iberian Peninsula with little difficulty. One town under Hannibal's control was called Saguntum, a place that Rome also claimed dominion over. Hannibal, never a friend to Rome, sieged the city, and thus the Second Punic War began. Rome immediately dispatched its primary forces to Sicily for a mainland invasion of Carthage, their first large mistake of the war, leaving Italy vulnerable and with weak, untrained troops. Hannibal turned his sights to Italy, and one of the most daring and staggering military achievements in the history of mankind, Hannibal marched his armies through the Rhone Valley and across the Alps in September of 218 BC. But regardless of the riskiness of his endeavor, Hannibal Barca emerged into northern Italy with more than 26,000 men, 27 war elephants. All elephants survived the crossing, yet over 74,000 men were lost to the incredible cold and the hostile tribes along the journey. Arriving on the other side, Hannibal encountered recently conquered Gaul tribes along the Po River, eager to shake the grip of their new Roman masters. After a cavalry engagement at the river Ticinus, the Gauls felt that they could put their allegiance in this new force. Together, Hannibal and his new allies destroyed Roman forces at the river Trebia, a minor battle yet costly to the Roman morale. After winter, Hannibal continued to annihilate two legions at Lake Tresemine and conquered the area now known as Tuscany. He then marched down the mainland of Italy on a mission to recruit reluctant allies of Rome to his cause. At this point, Roman morale was at an all-time low due to the fall of a consul in battle with Hannibal, Gaius Flaminius, and the loss of vast tracts of their homeland to their mortal enemy. During this darkness, they elected Quintus Fabius Maximus dictator. Their new leader employed a strategy of tailing and bullying Hannibal's army, yet never actually engaging him in a direct conflict. This strategy was seen as cowardly by the Romans, and Fabius quickly fell out of favor. Though unpopular, this military strategy was both wise and the perfect tactic to combat Hannibal for two reasons. First, by never engaging the superior military strength in battle, Fabius did not lose many men. And second, while slowly picking off straggling companies, Hannibal's forces were slowly dwindling, and due to Hannibal's isolation, he could not receive reinforcements. Now known as Fabian tactics or Fabian maneuvering, lesser armies have employed this strategy against a large, well-trained army to great success. For example, George Washington utilized Fabian maneuvers during the Revolutionary War against Great Britain. However, the unwise and impatient Roman Senate chose to attack Hannibal in one large, decisive battle. In July of 216, a Roman force of 80,000 men pinned down Hannibal's 50,000 at Cannae on the eastern Italian coast. The battle that followed on August 2nd, many military historians remember as, quote, a work of art. Hannibal arranged his troops in a convex crescent shape with his weakest troops in the middle and mighty cavalry on the ends. He and his brother fought with the weak troops in the middle to boost their morale as the elite Roman infantry in the middle of their formation pushed until Hannibal's crescent had concaved in upon itself. It was at this moment that his cavalry swung around the outside and encircled the now tightly packed Roman infantry. With this maneuver, Hannibal's lesser army had encircled a larger one. It is estimated that of the 80,000 Romans who took the field that day, only 3,000 escaped the slaughter. This great victory set into motion the revolt of many of the various regions of Italy. Furthermore, owing to Hannibal's charismatic nature, he was able to secure alliances with King Philip V of Macedonia and the ruler of Syracuse. It was at this time, the height of Hannibal's control in Italy, that he had all the power and ability to take Rome. Many historians still wonder why Hannibal did not make the move to destroy the Romans. 
Some believe that it was because of his lack of confidence in his ability to take on the great walls of Rome, or the fact that his soldiers, already tired and away from home for five years, had no inclination to siege the greatest city in the world. Whatever the cause, this is one of the great what-ifs of history. Had Hannibal not doubted his abilities, the world we live in would have been shaped by the influence of Carthage, and not that of Rome. However, Hannibal's success was fleeting. His armies had been in this foreign land for five years, and his forces were dwindling. He needed to get reinforcements, and fast. However, he failed to take port cities, and was pushed down the mainland of Italy into the toe of the boot. He engaged in guerrilla warfare, holding out using cunning and surprises as allies against the well-fortified and better-equipped Romans. Meanwhile, the Romans had gone on the offensive, reclaiming the territory of Iberia, eventually taking the capital. Shocked by this dramatic loss, the disheartened Carthaginian government sent for Hannibal's troops to be recalled from Italy and returned to Carthage, as a mainland invasion was imminent. On October 19, 202, that very event happened. The armies of Scipio Africanus and Hannibal Barca clashed on the fields of Zama. Hannibal tried to duplicate his maneuvers at Cannae, but failed as the Romans had superior cavalry. Hannibal's forces were surrounded and then annihilated. The general himself was able to flee to Carthage, where he oversaw the peace negotiations with Rome signed in the year 201. The terms of this agreement were incredibly harsh, crippling the military power of Carthage, as well as demanding reparation payments of some 10,000 talents, the equivalent of 17.22 billion U.S. dollars over the course of 50 years. Hannibal was relieved of his command by the Romans, and fled Carthage, unsuccessfully commanding troops in the Syrian war on behalf of some old allies. Eventually, the Romans tracked Hannibal down, only to discover he had taken his own life by poison to deny the Romans the pleasure of killing their greatest enemy. Hannibal Barca will always be remembered as one of the greatest military strategists and leaders of all time. His unconventional tactics, bold maneuvers, and ability to gain the unwavering support of both his men and allies were a nearly unstoppable combination for the greatest empire the world has ever seen. Hannibal Barca, the man who could have destroyed Rome.